Hi, this is Magdi Isa, your teacher for Anatomy and Physiology by 201 Lab. This video, just like all of my other videos, is intended to be for GCU students who are enrolled in one of my classes. Please do not share this video with any other student that is not a part of my class. Today we're going to cover Lab 9, which is the interdimentary system, which is basically the skin and the associated structures. So the skin is made of two main components. The first one is going to be my epidermis and the second one is the dermis. Hypodermis is not a part of the skin. So let me repeat this again. The hypodermis, which is this part here, this is not a part of the skin. Skin is only two main layers. Epidermis is going to be the upper layer, which is made of epithelium, and the dermis is the second layer, which is made of connective tissue. This picture so shows more details of the skin. So this is again my epidermis, this is going to be my dermis, and this is the hypodermis, which is not part of the skin. The epidermis is epithelium, which is stratified squamous epithelium, and in the case of the skin, it is also keratinized. The uh, dermis is made of two main layers. The first one is my papillary layer, which is much smaller. It is probably 20% of the thickness of the uh, dermis. And then the second layer is the reticular layer. And both these of these two layers, they have different types of connective tissue. Then the hypodermis is below the skin and it's also called the superficial fascia. Associated with the skin, multiple structures, we call these appendages of the skin. An example of that are the sweat glands. So this is one of the, this is a sweat gland. We have also mu uh, smooth muscle here called erector pilei muscle. Then we have also some nervous structures. This one include uh, pacinian corpuscles, also includes some sensor nerve fibers and other receptors. As you can see, uh, the skin, um, the epidermis of the skin does not have any no, uh, any uh, blood vessels that are traveling through it. However, there are some nerves that reach to the epidermis, which is expected because the epidermis is actually a type of epithelium. Next, we will go now over details. Uh, so let's start with the epidermis, and we are familiar with this picture. This is keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So this is all my epithelium which is my epidermis and this is my dermis. So if we start with the cell types we have four cell types inside the epidermis. These cell types include keratinocytes, melanocytes, tactile epithelial cells also called Merkold corpuscles. In addition to that we have dendritic cells. Well for the purpose of this lecture we're going to focus only on two types the keratinocytes and the melanocytes. So this picture here um, is a small section of the skin and as you can see all these very uh, like frequently located cells these are my keratinocytes and that cell here is going to be my melanocytes. So keratinocytes these are the most abundant cells of the epidermis and it contains keratin. Keratin is the main component inside these cells. These cells originate at the basal layer and they start growing and going up. So as more cells divide, the older layers will be pushed up and up. And as they reach the top, which is here, they are full of keratin and the, dead, the cell is dead. So the cells at this point are basically dead and they're basically a bag that's full of keratin. This process takes about one to one and a half month. So every one or one and a half month, your skin changes. So that layer that starts here at the basal layer will be pushed to the top in one to one and a half month. And then you just get rid of it. So that layer falls. The second cell type is the, are the melanocytes, and these ones are spider shaped, and they are always in the basal layer. These ones do not move anywhere, they're just there. 
and these ones are responsible for giving your skin its color. They have melanin, and melanin is the main skin pigment. Melanin is very important because it protects you actually from the sun rays, from actually the ultraviolet rays of the sun. If you were not protected from these uh, ultraviolet rays, uh, these rays can reach to your nuclei and they can destroy them. So that's why melanocytes are very important um, in protecting our cells from becoming a cancer. Because if you get these ultraviolet uh, rays reach your DNA, they will destroy it and the cell will transform to a cancer cell because it will not uh, be any more regulated in terms of its, its growth rate. So um, between now there are light-skinned people and there are also dark-skinned people. This Both people, they have the same number of melanocytes. The only difference is in the light-skinned people, they have lysosomes that will digest this melanin granule. They will have less melanin granules and that's why they appear a uh, lot with lighter skin. The ones that have dark skin, those ones, they do not destroy their melanin. That's why they keep more melanin and that melanin gives them more protection. So um, why melanin is protective? So if we go back to the previous slide, you can see here my melanocyte. It looks like spider and it has these processes. So these processes, they inject their melanin granules into the keratinocytes. So this is my melanocyte. It makes the melanin. Melanin will travel through the processes and these processes will inject the melanin into the keratinocytes. So what's the melanin going to do? Well, melanin is going to make an umbrella that's going to cover the nuclei from the sun rays. So this will be the, uh, the way that melanin is going to protect our nuclei from the ultraviolet rays. So ultraviolet comes here and gets reflected because we have melanin and this way we're protecting our uh, uh, nuclei. The other thing I want to talk about is the sun tanning. So when you go out in the sun, that stimulates your melanocytes to make more melanin Thus, it gives you more protection from ultraviolet rays. So here is an FYI slide, but it's very important to know. These are, uh, we have three main types of cancer. We'll talk about two today. We have malignant melanoma, which is very, very type of cancer, but it's very, very aggressive. It kills very fast. So if you see a lesion on your skin that looks like this, it's probably malignant melanoma, which is a skin cancer that kills very quickly. So how do I know that? Well, there is a pattern for these for these uh, cancers. So A, B, C, D, E. A, asymmetry. So as you can see, this lesion is asymmetrical, which means that this, this side here is not like that side here. The borders are irregular, as you can see here. The borders are not... Um, regular so it's not like going into a circle or oval oval shape the colors are different so this area here has a light color this one has a dark color the diameter has to be more than six millimeters um, which is basically the size of your pencil eraser so if you have a, a lesion in your skin that's bigger than that size then that satisfies this criteria and finally, this lesion is going to be elevated, which means that it's not at the same skin level. It's going to be higher than skin level. So uh, luckily that this type of cancer is rare, the rarest skin cancer. However, it's the one that's most malignant. And as we live in Arizona here, we are exposed to a lot of ultraviolet rays. And these ultraviolet rays, they can destroy your nuclei in your keratinocytes and allow them to uh, allow the cell to divide without control and they become cancer. The second type is the basal cell carcinoma and this one looks like that. So it looks like a nodule on your skin. This one is the most common skin cancer. However, it's the least aggressive type of skin cancer. Um, this nodule is associated with 
uh, telangiectasias, which is basically these um, very prominent capillaries here. So this lesion is less common, uh, sorry, more common but less, less aggressive. If somebody has this type of cancer, it's most probably not going to invade the rest of the organs in his body and it can be easily excised and removed. However, if you go back to malignant melanoma, this one is really going to kill the person fast. The third type is squamous cell carcinoma, which um, is not as common as the basal cell carcinoma and not as malignant as malignant melanoma, so it's in between. So next is going uh, to be the layers of the epidermis. Uh, we have a few layers of the epidermis. The first layer here, the one that's on the bottom, this one is called stratum bisali or stratum germinativum. The English translation is basal layer, but of course for the exam purposes you need to know the Latin words. Stratum bisale or stratum germinativum. The second layer here, these of these few layers, is going to be my stratum spinosum. And as you can see here, actually there are spinous, these little spinous processes here. Well, that's why we call these stratum spinosum because there are processes between these cells, and I will explain soon why these processes are there. Then we have stratum granulosum, which is that layer that includes lots of granules. See all these granules here? Well, so it's easy to identify this layer, stratum granulosum. And then you have stratum lucidum, the clear layer. This one is not here. We'll see it only in thick skin. But since this light comes from thin skin, you cannot see it here. The last layer is going to be my stratum corneum. So this layer is the dead part of your skin. These are basically the cells that do not have nuclei. As you can see, these are basically just bags of keratin. So here is my stratum lucidum, this clear skin layer that's present only in the thick skin. And as you can see, compare this height to this height. So this is stratum corneum. It's very thick here. That's why we call this thick skin. If you go back to this picture, this is my stratum corneum. And this is the rest of the epidermis. So the stratum corneum here is much smaller compared to this stratum corneum. That's why this is my thick skin. And where do we have this th thick skin? It's in the palms and soles. So let's talk about these layers one by one. We'll start first with stratum bisale or stratum germinativum. So this layer is the deepest layer of the skin and this one is my stem cells. It's actually the one that's mitotically active. So it divides, makes more cells and these cells are pushed upwards. The layer after that is going to be my stratum spinosum. This, this is a few layers of keratinocytes and these ones are characterized by desmosomes, so I want you to know this very well. The only layer that is characterized by desmosomes is my stratum spinosum. And there is a reason for these cells, um, the reason that these cells look like they have this spiny appearance. Well, like this is a cell here, this is another cell here of stratum spinosum. Another one here, another one here, and let me make another cell here, a last cell. So these cells here, they have their nuclei, and in between these cells, I do have desmosomes. And as we know, desmosomes are a type of junctions that's present between the epithelial cells and make cells stick together. So during the preparation of this slide, under, to be seen under the microscope, uh, certain processes occur and these processes result in dehydration of the cells, so these cells shrink. So under the microscope you see the cells like this. It looks like they have spinous processes now, even though like um, 
in reality, they don't have these processes, but because the cell shrank and because the cells are attached together very firmly through the desmosomes, it looks like as if these cells have spines, but they do not have spines. So again, just to summarize that, these spines are artifact due to the preparation process, process that occur in order for us to be able to see the cells under the microscope. However, in a living cell, these spines do not, are not present. They are just desmosomes. The next layer is my stratum granulosum, and these granules are actually my keratin granules and lamellated granules. So the keratohyaline granules are the ones that will transform to make keratin, and the lamellated granules here are basically the lipids. And it's very important to have the lipids in your skin because we are a bag of water. We are 70% of us is water. So if we have a layer of fat on us, then this water will not evaporate easily. Try to make this experiment in your balcony. So bring a cup of water and put in the balcony in the summer and get another cup of water also has the same amount of water but on this one add a layer of oil so make that oil covers the water completely of course oil is not gonna it's not going to mix with water and leave these in the sun and see after at the end of the day see how much of these cups are left of course at the end of the day you will find that a lot of this water has evaporated and not much of this water has evaporated because the oil or the fatty layer that's covering the uh, water here is protecting it from evaporation. So that's why these lamellated granules are very, very important in our body. Next, we have the stratum lucidum, which is present only in thick, in thick skin. So the stratum lucidum, again, under light microscope, is present but on the electron microscope, they found out that stratum lucidum is nothing more than a specialized layer of stratum corneum. What I'm trying to say here, that this layer is also is an artifact, so it's not really present because they found that it has the same components of cell like the one in stratum corneum. So if what I want you to know is stratum lucidum associate that with thick skin in the palms and soles and it's not present in any other places of our skin the last layer is stratum corneum and this layer is it's about 20 to 30 layers of dead cells and they are basically cells that are protecting our skin against penetration and they are shed regularly so what's the reason for having this big layers of dead cells? Well, you have bacteria here that come in your skin and we want to make it very hard for these bacteria to penetrate our skin because our skin is our first line of defense against invading organisms. So these stratum corneum, even though they're dead, but they're actually much, much more beneficial than other people in this life who are not dead. Next, we have the dermis. Uh, so let's start with the layer of the dermis. We have two main layers. We have the papillary layer because it has papilla here. So these are my papillae. So this is my first layer and it ends around here. And then the second layer is the reticular layer. And I would like to use your knowledge now of connective tissue and tell me what type of connective tissue is here and what type of connective tissue is here. So you can stop this video and think about it for a minute. Well, here, this is going to be loose areolar connective tissue and the, and the, in, the, in the papillary layer, but in the reticular layer, as you can see, this is going to be dense, irregular connective tissue. So in the stratum, in the strata or the layers of the dermis, I have two main layers again. 
I have the papillary layer and I have the reticular layer. In the papillary layer, I have dermal papilla, which are these projections. I also have a type of sensory receptors called mycinous corpuscles. While in the reticular layer, I have a type of sensory receptors called pacinia corpuscles. These receptors, they carry different types of sensation. I just want you to know that mycinous is high in the papillary layer, layer and the pacinian is low in the reticular layer. And both of these are going to be sensory receptors and they carry different types of sensation. So here is my slide on the dermis. We said we have connective tissue, the blood vessels and nerves are located there. We have a papillary layer which is 20%. Reticular layer is 80% of the thickness of the dermis. And this is loose areolar connective tissue. And this one is dense irregular connective tissue. There is an interesting concept called the cleavage lines and or tension lines. And if you look at your skin, look at your hands now and look at the back um, of your hands and look at the front of your wrist, you will see that you have skin lines. Well, these skin lines are actually lines of separation between collagen bundles. And they are completely um, have different orientation in different parts of the body. So as you see, if you look at your chest, you'll see that the direction of these fibers are like this. While in hands, they have orientation like that. In the knees, they have transverse orientation. They are oblique in the thighs. So these are all the uh, collagen bundles. As you know, again, the dermis has collagen and it is going to be a regular dense regular connective tissues to so these bundles they have a predominant direction in every part of our skin so we call these cleavage lines or tension lines and why this is important well it's important because if you want to make an incision in surgery you better make that incision parallel to these lines you don't want to cut a lot of these lines and if any of you had an appendectomy before when the doctor was removing the appendix, well, they make the incision this way. Why do they make it this way? It's not going to make any difference in the way that they can they view the appendix, but they're trying to go to parallel to the skin lines in this area in order not to cut more collagen fibers. Well, what's the problem if we cut more collagen fibers? The problem is if you cut collagen fibers this way, these fibers will retract. So everyone's going to go away from the other. And this will make the skin gap bigger and it's going to be harder to heal and you might get a bad scar. Now let's go to the hypodermis. Hypodermis is basically a deposed connective tissue and has different names. One of these is superficial fascia. Hypodermis connects your skin to the underlying structures, which are muscles, for the most part, of course. Now, we will talk about the appendages of the skin, and the uh, singular of appendages is appendix. So, these appendages include the spacious glands, sweat glands, nails, and hairs. So let's start with the sebaceous glands. We know the sebaceous glands secrete sebum, and that sebum has multiple functions. One of these is that it collects dirt on your skin because it is actually um, oil, oily layer. It also softens and lubricates your skin, and it allows, slows water loss because again, it's an oil layer. Oily layer that's covered in your skin and we are again made of water, so we don't want to lose this water. The last thing is that it kills also bacteria, so it has an antibacterial property. Where is it located? It's located everywhere in your body except the palms and soles because you want to have a firm grip, and that's why these ones are not located there. The spacious glands are associated with hair follicles. So here is one spacious gland. And here's my hair follicle. 
So there are classific the classification of spacious gland, as you guys remember from the uh, second lab, it's a simple alveolar. Simple because it has one straight duct, alveolar because the secretory unit is rounded. In addition to that, the mode of secretion is holocrine secretion, and this is the only example that I know of that has a holocrine secretion. So this is here, my spacious gland, and this is my hair follicle, and inside the hair follicle I have my hair. So these glands are associated with the hair follicles. They don't have any lumen, as you guys remember. These cells will make secretions, then they will explode. So the secretions will go to the hair follicle, and they will go to the top on the top of the skin. The next type is the sweat glands. The, the sweat glands are very important. There's two subtypes of that. We have the merocrine, also called eccrine gland, and we have the apocrine gland. So these are the main two types of sweat glands. And as you guys remember, it's simple coiled tubular gland. Remember this picture from last exam? It's a tube here, but this tube is coiled. So it's called tubular gland. It has one duct, so it's simple and simple coiled. We have some modified sweat glands. An example of that are the mammary glands. Actually, the mammary glands, one day they were sweat glands, and then they changed and they secrete milk, which is better than sweat. Then we have the seruminous glands. These ones are in your ear canals, and these ones secrete the waxy secretions in your ears. So these two are examples of modified sweat glands. Now, let's take this a look on this picture. I have, again, two types of sweat glands, apocrine and merocrine sweat glands. Merocrine is also called eccrine sweat glands. And as you remember, apocrine is a mode of secretion where the upper part of the cell breaks and is being released. The merocrine or eccrine gland secretion is the one that has the cell makes vesicles, and these vesicles are uh, secreted by exocytosis. I'm not going to ask you in the exam to identify any of these two pictures, so these two pictures are just FYI. So just know that there are two types of sweat glands. One of them is called apocrine, and this one is going to be associated with a hair follicle, and the other one's called Eccrine or merocrine, and these ones open directly on the skin. They're not associated with hair follicle. So this table is actually very important, and it is uh, differentiates between the merocrine and apocrine sweat glands. The merocrine sweat glands are the ones that secrete true sweat. What I mean by true sweat is basically um, ions and water. The apocrine secrete that true sweat in addition to fatty substances and protein. The merocrine sweat glands are located in the entire body with the exception of few locations and these are actually the axilla, the anal canal and genital areas. So around the anus, around the armpit and in the genital area you have apocrine sweat glands and I'm pretty sure that you guys all know that these are the areas where you have hair, thick hair, I'm talking about thick hair, and that's why the ducts of these sweat glands, the apocrine sweat glands, are associated with these thick hairs, while the ducts of the merocrine or, or eccrine sweat glands, these ones open directly at the skin surface. The function of uh, both of them the, sorry, let's start with the American first. This one functions throughout life, and this one starts at puberty under the influence of androgens. So the apocrine starts at puberty under the influence of androgens. And uh, the apocrine glands, they have secretion that is actually has a smell. So um, that's why babies actually, the baby sweat do not smell. The merocrine, they function in response to heat and stress. This one, the activity increase with, uh, with sexual foreplay. 
So if this is an if y slide. Uh, it's just if you wonder why do you have bad odor that comes from the sweat. Well, um, of course, the sweat that comes from the mirocrine or eccrine sweat glands, which are located in, on the rest of your body, these ones do not make a stink, like uh, they do not have bad odor. But the sweat that comes from your armpit, from the genital area, these ones really stink. And the reason for that is the following we have uh, fatty substances and proteins that are secreted from these apocrine glands and these fatty substances once they, once they are released on the skin well we have bacteria so we have bacteria all over our body we're covered by tremendous number of bacteria that's even more than our number of our own cells so these bacteria they find fat and protein so they are so happy they start eating this fat and protein they metabolize that and they give you a substance and these substances or these products of metabolism are the ones that have bad odor well what happens then when you put the 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 de 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 deodorant well this deodorant actually kills the bacteria it does not kill the sweat it does not kill the metabolites of the sweat it basic, basically kills the bacteria in this area so whatever you secrete it's not going to be metabolized and you're not going to have bad odor the next structure that we need to talk about is the nails nails just like hairs they are made of hard keratin it's more durable and tougher and we have multiple structures that we need to identify on the nail. We need to know that there is, let's start from here. First, we have a proximal nail fold, which is that part of the skin. And we have also lateral nail folds, which are here. And then this very thin, skinny layer of your skin that's above your nail if you can look at your nails now and you will see that there is a very small tiny layer that is um, very transparent and you can see the rest of the nail through it so we call this the cuticle or the eponychium so the eponychium is this layer here this part here and then of course this is the body of the nail and this is the free edge of the nail and if we have a lateral view of the nail, then we can see more structures. So again, here, this is my free edge here. This is the body of the nail here. And where is the nail sleeping? It's sleeping on the nail bed. So here is my nail bed. Here is uh, an area that has lots of important structures. We saw this part before. So this is my proximal nail fold. And this is my eponychium or cuticle. But most importantly, we need to see the nail root and matrix. So I want you to think about the nail like nothing other than um, a thick layer of keratin. So let's think about our, epiderm our uh, epidermis and dermis again. We had an epidermis. And then we had the dermis and then above the epidermis or the most superficial layer of the epidermis it was called stratum corneum or the keratin which is here well this is the same case here in the nail we have dermis we have epidermis and we have the keratin layer so that was here my keratin layer However, our nails do not grow perpendicularly like the rest of our skin. They just grow vertically. So as you can see here, this is my epidermis that's kind of making a sandwich around the nail root. So that this layer, we call it the nail matrix. And the nail matrix makes the keratin and the keratin grows transversely like this. So basically the nail is nothing more than a modified keratin. Next is the hair. As you know, as you know, the hair is also hard keratin, 
and it has epidermal and dermal pockets. So here is my hair, which is again keratin. It is surrounded by epidermis and dermis. So this is a picture of my skin. This is my dermis, this is my epidermis, and this is my keratin. So again, this is the same exact organization, but it is different in the way in the in the way they are put together. So let me try to write that to draw this for you. So this is my skin again. I have a layer here. So this is my keratin. I have a second layer here. So this is my the rest of the epidermis. And I have a last layer here, which is my dermis. So I want you to imagine that I just came with something or with my finger and I pressed on the skin layers like that down. So they make them all these parts go down. So let me see if I can show you this. So as I push down here, what happened to these layers? So this layer here, the keratin layer is going to go down like this. And this one's going to go down like that. And the red, the uh, epidermis is also going to go down like this. So this keratin layer is going to be my hair. So this is my hair, which is all keratin. And the hair is surrounded by epidermis, which is here. And surrounded by dermis which is here so this is similar to what we just saw here on the uh, PowerPoint so here is my keratin here is my epidermis and here is my dermis but they are just in different pattern so if you're unable to understand this you can ask me in the lecture and I will draw it for you on the board On this slide, this slide just shows you uh, in a very clear way the shaft and the root of the hair. So this part here of the hair, just above the skin, we call this shaft. The part that of the hair just below the skin, we call that root. So again, here is my hair follicle, which is the pocket that I have my hair inside. Here is my shaft, here is my root, and attached to the hair follicle, there is a small muscle here. It's a smooth muscle, and we'll call this erector pili muscle. I would like you to know the spelling of this muscle very well. What else we have? We have some hair follicle receptors. So there are some nerve endings that are attached to these hair follicles. So these are very important sensory receptors. Now I want you to try to experiment this yourself without touching your skin. Just try to touch your hair follicles and see if you will feel something or not. Well, if you feel something, this means that your hair shaft and root has moved. And as they moved, the, the sensory receptors also will move and will uh, feel that sensation. The last concept that I need to cover today is going to be the colors. And these are just FYI slides for your information. The colors comes from melanocytes and from other uh, structures. As you can see uh, on uh, here, I'm talking about the hair colors. So here are my melanocytes. And these melanocytes are at the root of the hair follicle and they also make melanin and they inject the melanin to the keratinocytes. These keratinocytes will migrate towards the top as more and more keratinocytes from the stratum basale are dividing and proliferating. If you get a gray hair, what happens at that time? Well, there is a decreased production of melanin and that's why the hair color changes with age. When it comes to the skin color, we have three main pigments. We have melanin, keratin, and hemoglobin. Melanin is the most important pigment. 
but also the keratin gives you this yellowish pigmentation. It comes from the kerosene tomatoes. So if you want to have some nice skin colors, well, eat lots of kerosene tomatoes. The last one, which works only for Caucasians, is the hemoglobin, since the Caucasians have very light skin. So if they stand a lot in the summer, the blood vessels will dilate. And you can see the, the red color of hemoglobin under their skin. So I'm done with my part. Now it's your turn to do some questions. Thank you for watching this video and have a great day.